I want to love and accept you. I want to tell you what, my, what I believe the Bible is to be true. I'm not going to compromise my belief system because of political correctness. There's a right way and there's a wrong way to do something. If you're going to choose to do the wrong way, I believe the series of choice of wrong choices could lead to eternal separation from God. I believe the Bible. I believe heaven's a real place. I believe hell's a real place. That's where it gets dicey. It's not going to stop me from loving you. If you choose to say, I want to be part of this community, I want to be protected in this community, but I want to choose to live different than you, you have to understand, I'm going to love you, but at the same time, I'm going to challenge you. Why? Because I believe if I ever see a person standing on the ledge, and they say, I'm going to jump, they don't just say, jump. What do we do? We do everything within our power to convince the person, don't jump. I believe when we live in a life apart from God, when we live a life apart from biblical truths, when we make wrong choices that are leading us away from God, we're living life on a ledge. In the name of political correctness, in the name of growing the church, in the name of not offending somebody, we let people live on the ledge. My question is, is it more loving to let them jump and die? Or is it more loving to do everything you can to stand underneath them and say, No, don't jump. Wait, let's have a conversation. Let's see if I can talk you off the ledge. It's where it gets dicey. Because on the one hand, you're accepted. But you better believe. The only way I know how to preach, the only way I know how to teach, is with the words of God. And the words of God are countercultural. It's a lot like the story I came across with, with Babe Ruth, George Herman Ruth, one of the best baseball players of all time. Well, in the waning days of his career, he gets traded to the Boston Braves. And, and Babe is just happy. He's, I mean, he's pretty much done at this point. He's no longer the, the man that was hitting 715 home runs and calling his shots and just crass, and, but he could hit the ball all the way. This day, he just, just wasn't there anymore. He struck out every time he was up the bat. At one point in the outfield, he made three different errors, which led to five runs being scored. Now, the Braves thought they were getting the Babe Ruth that was hitting the home runs and just kind of this, this iconic phenomenon that we still talk about today as one of the best baseball players of all time. Wasn't that man anymore. And so he comes walking off the field, glove under hand, and just, just despondent. And the cat calls and the boos and the death threats because of he's not who he once was. When I was reading the story, it says there's a little boy who jumps up out of his seat onto the field and runs to him and just wraps his arms around him and just hugs him. The babe picks him up, walks back, puts him in the dugout, and puts him back in the stand and goes back into the dugout. I think when we read that we're supposed to have a childlike faith, it's like that. Being part of the community, you know, there's going to be times you just don't, just don't feel it. There's times where you just need someone to come alongside you, put an arm around you and say, you know what? I love you and I'm here for you. That's what the church is. I love the words of, of Paul in Galatians chapter 6 and 1. If someone is caught in a sin, the, the word that literally caught is tangled in the web. You who are spiritual, gently restore him. But watch out so you too are not tempted. I said, it's a double-edged sword. We're going to love you, accept you. But because we're human and we fall short, we should all be challenging each other to become more like Christ. It's, it's being able to be authentic. There, there's this joke, this story that's been told probably many different ways. It's, it's a lawyer, or it's a, a general, or it's a doctor who's trying to impress somebody. Walking into his office for the very first time. And so this doctor, general lawyer, picks up the phone and it's usually, yes, Mr. President, or General Schwarzkopf, or 
district attorney, attorney general, and some name, kind of name drop in, and so he's kind of talking to him for a little bit, and, and he gets done, and he hangs up the phone, and so there's this little man standing there with his, his little box, and he says, man, I'll help you, I'm busy, and yeah, I'm here to connect your phone. How many times in life did we put up a false front that we want to think that we're esteemed? Well, you know why I'm going to name drop? Because maybe if I say the right name and then you know that person, you may go, oh, I can't believe you know. But again, what happens? It's not our Sunday best. Make sure the shoes are shined up, the kids look nice, the spouse is all put together. The very last thing before we walk out the door is put on that mask. And what happens when you walk around with that mask? It's wobbling. We come together in community in our own little bubble. Why? Because you really don't want to see the real Ben that's in here. I mean, if I take off this mask, you're going to see a person that's pretty broken. You're going to see a person that struggles with some things. That's what we think. So what happens? It's the top. Put on the mask. You want to freak some people out? At some point when they ask you how you're doing, tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I, I remember one day I was like, you know what? I'm tired of this. I don't know at what point church became, let's all put on a Sunday best, make sure you have the best looking mask. And so if somebody said, how you doing? Oh, I'm too blessed to be stressed because I serve the best. <laughs> Amen, brother. I agree with you. So one, one Sunday, I remember, I was like, you know what? Forget this. I'm having a bad day. I'm just going to tell my mom I'm going to have a bad day. I said, like, didn't let me sleep last night. Me and Amanda were fighting because of finances. So I was, I was in a huff. I'm walking around. Somebody said, Pastor, how, how, how you doing today? I said, I'm having a bad day. I said, didn't sleep last night. We're worried about the finances. I just, I, I probably shouldn't even be here today. And the person goes, well, amen, brother, you have a good day. And, 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 and took a step away, and he was like, wait a second, what did you just say? Because we become conditioned. All he heard was, I'm doing okay, how are you? That's all he heard. And all of a sudden he was like, uh, well, I'll pray for you. And then he was like, ran, ran in the other direction. Like, he actually told me how he was feeling. How dare he? But if you come to a place that you know you're accepted no matter what, what would happen if we took off the mask? Because many times it's kind of like a rock that sat in the same place for a long time. What happens when you plunk that rock? It's all creepy, crawling, nasty, weird stuff. And that's what happens if we, some of us, our mask have been on for so long that we're afraid to take it off. Healing only comes when you take the mask off and say, you know what? Sometimes I feel like this scary little boy. You know what? There's some times where every time I, I go past the pub, I can't stop until I'm drunk. Then there's times where every time I'm on the internet and we start to tell stories after story. The first couple times people go like, what's wrong with you? You're not supposed to tell me those names. And you go, oh, man. You don't understand how good it feels to be authentic and real. I've never told anybody that before. And know that you're accepted no matter what. Again, look at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 26. 37 to 38. Jesus is about ready to be killed on the cross. He's praying in, in the garden. He, he's, he's praying, his, his sweat has become like drops of blood. And he goes back to his best friends who are sleeping. He wakes them up and he says, Hey, Jesus, really, what's going on? He says, This, my soul is crushed with grief. To the point of death. He doesn't say, oh, I'm God, I'm going three days, I'm going to raise from the dead. I'm, oh, I'm cool. I mean, I'm a little worried about the whole beating thing, dying. I love good. 
Well, he, he's, he's real. And he's authentic. It's the idea of iron rubbing iron. If there was a process to actually talk to the iron, I know I'm weird when I'm thinking of being able to talk to iron. Do you think that's a painful process for the iron? Yes. Please don't rub the other stuff on me. It hurts. It's honing us. It's making us sharper. That's the reason. We have to take off the mask. We have to. Start to share those burdens, those requests that maybe you've never told anybody else. So that true healing can come. What happens at that point? It's kind of flipped on its head. Because we think, well, if I tell somebody my, my secret struggles, that secret sin, or I tell them what's really going on, they're not really going to love and accept me and appreciate me. Like, they're going to judge me. Because I'm the only person. Usually this is what I've noticed. When you start to share with that, somebody else weeps. I thought I was the only one. I didn't know that. that we have the same, the same thing. We just have to pour into each other. We just have to build each other up. The Bible says our tongue is like a two-edged sword. Our words have the ability to cut somebody down, to build them up. To tear them down, or to build them up. I had this, this was the summer, one of my favorite summers in my entire life. I worked out at a place called uh, Youth Haven. It's a camp for, for troubled kids. Uh, it was my favorite summer, but this was my worst week that I thought someone was going to kill me. Mainly because it was a, a fifth, almost sixth grader who told me, Ben, when you go to sleep, I'm going to kill you. Well, I guess I'm not going to sleep this week. Because the six kids that I had came from two rival games. Um, and somebody in their geniusness decided to put three in my group and then three, so the two rival gangs, all six of them, were all together in one cabin. It was so much fun. And then one of them said, hey, stop trying to love on us, and that's why I'm going to kill you in your sleep. Through the course of the week of talking to them, I mean, we basically sat around and talked because we couldn't go anywhere because they would fight with each other, or they would want to fight with their kids. They said it was a way of life. You don't understand this. The only family that you have is the person that's watching your back. And they said, I would die for one of these. I said, you, you're in the fifth grade. You don't, you don't understand. And so they would call each other names and they would cuss at each other. And so the entire week, I kept talking about edification. Edification means to build up. You guys, with those words, you have the choice. You can logically make the choice. Are you going to pour into someone and build them up or are you going to tear them down? And so they would, and we'd be going somewhere and somebody would cuss at someone. They would say something mean to somebody else. And they would have to stop. That would say, okay, what are we, what's going on right now? He's over there, he's not building somebody else. We're supposed to build each other. Like, Absolutely. Like, I'm going to ingrain this into you. So I'll never forget, it was towards the end of the week, when the two rival games, there was one kid that said something mean to somebody else. His other gang member, his other friend, smacked him right upside the back of his head. He said, remember, we're supposed to edify, stupid. <laughs> you know what? It's taking place. You're right. Edify means to build up. Probably not the best way to call them stupid. But you know, at least, at least we're getting it. Um, and, th and that's what should happen. When we come to church, you start to see how we should build on top of each other. If you know that you're accepted for who you are, we're well, going to challenge you to be better, but you're accepted for who you are. And so because you're accepted, why not take off the mask so that healing can begin? So that we can edify, build each other up. James 3, chapter 10, or verse 10 and 11 says, Can both blessing and cursing flow from the same mouth? Should not be. Proverbs 15, 4. Kind words bring life.